All right. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to uh, catch up a little bit on some of the lecture materials for uh, Tuesday, March 16th. Uh, where we left off was uh, the question of what is melted to produce uh, parental island arc magmas. And I don't know if you remember, Amanda was talking about this, um, that there can be multiple materials. You could melt oceanic crust, sediments, mantle wedge, and the arc crust. Each of these contributes a different geochemical signature to the magmas that are produced. And so, for example, if you look at um, the mantle wedge, okay, so that's this region right in here, that is the source for most primary basaltic arc magmas. That's where most of the melting occurs. Um, there can be melting, direct melting of the oceanic crust. Sediments do contribute to uh, some of the melts. And there's reworking of material that occurs in the arc crust. Um, and so that's where the really silicic rocks come from. It's, it's really all of this uh, reworking. We don't need to go into the details of all of this. Um, just very quickly, this is neodymium isotopes versus strontium isotopes. This is a really common plot that people put up for looking at the geochemistry of, of different materials. And really what it's supposed to get at is what is being mixed to create magmas. And so if you look at mid-ocean ridge basalts, they live up here. Bulk earth is right there at the, at the zeros. And then these are the arrays of different, um, of different arc compositions. And all that this is trying to show is that if you start out with something that comes from the mantle and you mix it with seawater, then it's going to come off in this direction. And if you mix it with sediments, it's going to come off in this direction. And that when we look at these arcs, like especially Banda, which is in the Western Pacific, and the Lesser Antilles in the Atlantic, we see these mixing arrays that go off towards other contaminating materials, in this case seawater, and then also sediments and uh, crustal rocks. Okay, so I'm not going to ask you questions about neodymium and strontium isotopes, just to give you the sense that um, there is this mixing process that occurs. There are these other contributors to the geochemistry, and we can track them using isotopes. So um, an, a really important thing in all of this is to trace um, the flow of water through the system. Right, because we've talked about this before, that um, it's the water fluxing that occurs in um, the mantle wedge that drives most of the uh, melting, and that you need this water to decrease the temperature of melting to produce the melts in the first place. So where does that water come from? Well, the basalts and the sediments um, contain water. The, the sediments just have water in them because they start out with mud and also there's um, pore water. Um, but remember that the basaltic crust and, and even some of the underlying mantle lithosphere becomes hydrated at the mid-ocean ridge. And so they start out with a bunch of hydrated minerals in them uh, from the get-go. Um, and so it depends on the temperature, but the, the slab is gonna have um, amphiboles. If you remember, amphophilite was that orthoamphibole. A chlorite can be there, serpentine can be there. In the sediments, there, there are clays. Um, and so these will all um, stabilize, not just as the slab descends, but also when it first becomes hydrated at the mid-ocean ridge. And then there are a whole series of mineral transformations that occur as the slab descends. And as you know, at, at higher temperatures, the metamorphic minerals uh, break down and so when, as they break down in this region, they're releasing water, and the water is going up, and it is interacting with the mantle wedge here. Here is an example. Um, here's a pressure versus temperature diagram. And so here is a field that has um, coexist. This would be for a, uh, an ultramafic rock. Um, this would be a field of the stable minerals that would be um, present in this rock at whatever this is, blue schist face these conditions, clinopyroxene, olivine, antigorite, which is serpentine, chlorite, and brucite. Brucite is um, MgOH2. And so antigorite, chlorite, and brucite all have water in them. 
as if this is the geotherm that the rocks are following, then the first thing that happens is they enter this field and there's no more brucite. So brucite breaks down and releases water. And then you go up into this field. Now antigorite has broken down to form orthopyroxene and olivine. And that releases water. And then up here, it's still higher, chlorate breaks down to form an anhydrous assemblage, including garnet. And so water is released there as well. So this whole process by which the rocks are going down the subduction zone, they are progressively dewatering by the breakdown of these hydrous phases to form progressively more and more anhydrous uh, minerals. Um, so in the shallow regions of the, of the mantle wedge, um, the temperatures aren't high enough to melt. And so um, all that happens is that the anhydrous material here becomes hydrated. So it's, it's kind of a strange thing if you think about it. There's water that's being driven off of the slab, and it is entering the mantle wedge, and it's getting locked up in there. Most of it gets locked up as serpentine. Um, but there's a transfer of water from the top of the slab into the base of the mantle wedge. In, as you get deeper, there's still this dehydration that occurs at higher temperature reactions. And that water, when it rises vertically, um, is sufficient to cause partial melting in the hottest regions of this circulating mantle flow. So remember the mantle is flowing around like this. <clears throat> that generates a high temperature core here to the mantle wedge. The water comes off here, enters this part of the mantle wedge, and causes melting. Now, what exactly is that process? Well, it turns out that there were some, a set of experiments done uh, five, 10 years ago at uh, MIT by uh, Christy Till. She's a professor at uh, Arizona State University now. And what she showed was that it's this breakdown of chlorite um, at very high pressures and temperatures. This is approaching 100 kilometers depth, where we think the, you know, if you think about where the arc is over the top of the subducting slab, it's about 100 kilometers. So we go down 100 kilometers. It seems to be this chloride breakdown reaction that is releasing the fluids that then percolate up and cause the melting. And so you melt in here, um, forms basalt. Uh, the basalt rises, interacts with the crust, differentiates. We've, we've talked about all these different processes that occur. Um, and then this gives rise to a whole bunch of other different kinds of rocks that we might see. Um, right. Let me back up a second here. Um, it's also possible for, if it's deep enough, for the slab to melt directly. Um, and so there are some very deep melts that can be produced um, and, and those can create other types of um, compositions. I think I mentioned adakites, A-D-A-K. Adak is an island in the Aleutians. It has a special kind of, of um, rock uh, called an adakite, and that seems to be the direct melting of the, the top of the subducting slab. So if you look at um, the proportions of rock types in volcanic arcs, um, this is basalt, basaltic andesite, andesite, so andesite is intermediate, dacite, more silicic, rhyolite, very silicic. And what you find is that basaltic andesite and andesite are the dominant rocks that you find erupted at island arcs. Okay, it's not basalts, and it's not even rhyolites, not really silicic things. It's stuff that's sort of mafic to intermediate in composition. And you might ask yourself, why would that be? What sorts of processes would give rise to these intermediate compositions rather than basalts? And why don't we get these, these really silicic rocks? And there are a couple possibilities. One is that it's straight up differentiation of the basalt. Um, it could be that there is mixing with these other rhyolites that have come from either earlier distillation processes, or they could be um, it could be a, a continental arc, of course. Um, and it could also be that intermediate magmas could form by direct melting of the, of the slab. Um, it does turn out that continental arcs have more silicic components. So if you look at the Andes, the 
dominant rock is, not surprisingly, an andesite, named after the Andes. Um, but you see a lot more dacite and a lot more rhyolite, than, um, especially dacite, than you see for ocean-ocean um, uh, island arcs, uh, uh, volcanic systems. Okay, so you tend to get more mafic components in the island arc systems and more silicic, felsic components in, um, in the uh, continental arcs. So, um, possibilities, why do you get this? Well, the magmas are, are going to differentiate, and um, as you know, the basalts are pretty dense, and they don't really want to rise up to the surface. And so they could rise up a little ways and differentiate, and then you could write, a magma could rise because of buoyancy, um, and then that could erupt. And that would be a way of differentiating a magma to a more silicic composition. And there are lots of ways that, that this can happen. Um, you can have fractional crystallization, right? So this is where we form olivine crystals or pyroxene crystals, chromite crystals. These settle down, and the magma that's left behind is more uh, silica and aluminum rich. Um, it's possible that you could um, assimilate other rocks that are already there, although that kind of begs the question where they, where they come from. And you could have different magmas that are mixing. You could have this kind of process going on, and then this melt could be extracted and go off somewhere else and undergo its own fractional crystallization. So there's lots of different sorts of processes here that could, could go on. Um, but these are the things we talk about. Fractional crystallization and assimilation are often lumped together into a process called AFC, assimilation, fractional crystallization. And then magma mixing is, is sort of a, a, a different ball of wax. Um, as you might expect, magma chambers are, are pretty complicated. This is an image of um, an artist's conception of, of what the Skergard um, layered mafic intrusion looked like as it was um, crystallizing. And so what you have is this outward to inward crystallization, top down, bottom up, outward to inward, with this circulation cell going around and stuff being moved around. You can have crystals that are being uh, dragged along in density currents. You can have these plumes of, of plagioclase crystals and, and blocks of, of rock. That's what an autolith is. Um, yeah, so it can, it, you can imagine it gets pretty complicated. But one of the interesting things about this is that if you were to just look at a profile here of the kind of composition that is occupying the pore space between crystals. If you look at the outer edge of a magma chamber, this part of the magma chamber, in principle, could have seen the most fractional crystallization, and so it would be the most silicic. This would be the, the interior of the magma chamber would be um, the uh, primary liquid and so you might have a range of compositions of liquids present in a magma chamber could be zoned from the outside to the inside where the outside is more silicic and the inside is more mafic. Now you could have accumulates on the bottom which are you know, totally different, but if you're just looking at interstitial liquids, they may be more silicic on the outside, more mafic on the inside. Um, and an important thing about this is that mafic liquids are not very viscous at all. They flow really easily. You've seen those basalt flows that just, you know, they flow out like water. Um, whereas rhyolites are super, super stiff. That's what this viscosity is. Viscosity is measured in poise, and we're looking at like nine orders of magnitude difference between a basalt and a rhyolite. And so you might ask yourself, well, there could be these liquids here, but which ones are mobile? Right. Basalts and andesites can be mobile because they're not very viscous, um, and, but basalt is really dense. Andesite, maybe not so dense because it's more silicic. Rhyolite and dacite, well, they're going to be more silicic, so they're going to be less dense, but they're also really stiff. Um, there's also a question of the mobility of melts depending on how many crystals there are. Um, if there's a low fraction of crystals, then the melts are all moving around and, and everything is getting mixed. 
as the, as the crystals adopt a certain fraction, then they can compress. They're not, it's too stiff to like move around, but the crystals can settle and compact and, and filter press the liquid out the top. If it gets too crystalline though, then um, everything gets locked up. And so there's this intermediate crystallinity stage where you don't have convection to stir everything up, but the permeability allows for the melts to separate from the crystals by this crystal compaction mechanism. There is assimilation that occurs. Here is an example. Um, I think this is from the, the scare guard where this is the very top of the, top of the intrusion. Um, I'm not positive, it might be a different intrusion. So. And what you're looking at here is nice, Archean nice, mixed in with the original liquid. Here's some other material that has been uh, mixed in. And so what happens is the, um, the melt comes in and it uh, breaks off a whole bunch of these chunks of rock. And those rock, that rock mixes with the original magma and makes a more silicic magma. Well, the silicic magma is going to be more buoyant, um, and so it's just going to perch on top of this big old magma chamber. And that's what you're looking at here. This is the more mafic magma chamber below it, and then this is the silicic uh, magma top to it. If you look at compositions, here's the original basalt, here's the gneiss, and so you can get compositions that span between them. It's basically just a mixing line. Um, you can also see um, other evidence for incomplete mixing. Here's a more mafic magma with a more felsic material and a reaction rind around it. You'll see this in uh, labs. You know, a lot of times in andesites, you'll see crystals that have reaction zones around them because they're reacting with a new melt that has come in. Um, these are two different magmas that have uh, that are starting to mix together, but incompletely. And this is what I was talking about. So you can see this kind of reaction where an amphibole crystal, hornblende crystal here, reacted with whatever liquid this was to create this reaction rind. This crystal is, is getting resorbed dissolved away in these embayments are, are what these are called and there's some compositionally distinct rim on it. Um, you can see a core here. This must be in cross polars. So there's a, an optically distinct core and a compositionally and optically distinct margin and then another little rim on top of that. And you can see this olivine crystal is getting all busted up and the clinopyroxene doesn't look very happy. It's separated into, into little globs. Oh, and also, here's an example where olivine and quartz do not coexist, assuming that this is a mafic, or mafic, is a magnesium-rich olivine, right? They would react to form orthopyroxene normally. So um, there are lots of ways that the magma mixing and uh, these other processes can explain why andesites turn out to be so abundant at uh, volcanoes. Um, the magma mixing can, can create these intermediate compositions and the more silicic magmas are just too viscous to, to get to the surface and the basaltic magmas are uh, just too dense to get up to the surface. So whether you create andesites by magma mixing or by this sort of filter pressing and um, fractional crystallization uh, combined with assimilation of something else, uh, regardless, it seems to be this combination of the right density and the right viscosity to be eruptible um, is, as opposed to rhyolites that are, that are too sticky and basalts that are too dense.